Thank you very much, Joe. When I was tasked with um, kind of putting together the basic research important prerequisites for future studies section, I, I, I guess I sort of took this as an opportunity to, um, you know, put out a bit of a wish list on why, where I would like to see Dupuytren's disease research go. And, um, and some of that, I guess, was based around, you know, what are the, the, the needs, at least in my laboratory. But I also felt a little bit intimidated by this whole program. So I thought I really need to go to ask a couple of other very smart people to help me out to do this. So fortunately, I've managed to uh, get Rude Bank and Dominic Furnish to, um, to come and give some of their thoughts as well, because they're a lot smarter than I am. And so we might be able to sort of come up with some general ideas of all of the things that Joe covered in terms of, you know, research priorities, where I think we should go. And I'm even going to try and do something a little challenging in just a moment. We'll see how it goes. So um, I have no conflicts of interest as usual. Um, so what are, is it that we're trying to do? I'm going to propose that for basic science perspective, what we should be trying to do is to create a reproducible and representative model of Dupuytren's disease uh, development in the lab. Because then we can do reproducible studies that we can sort of consistently identify potential new treatments. We find kind of things that it's very hard to do in people because people are so divergent. We want to use those models to design repro um, and reproducibly test new therapeutic interventions. Um, my question was, okay, so who do I need to get to make all this happen? So I guess that, that made me think about, so what will be the Dupuytren's disease researchers of the future? Well, who do the people who want to get in here in the next five years to really make this fly? Um, the basic research landscape is evolving rapidly for all of the points that Joe put up there. There's changes in funding levels, we need to collaborate more, we need to do all of these things together. But also the science is expanding enormously. Um, we're already seeing uh, sort of some of the data coming out of genome-wide association studies. I'm going to speak about a couple of other sort of getting even more complex genetic studies that are, that are ongoing. And we need to start pushing the envelope and catching up with many of our colleagues in cancer and many other sort of areas of research so that we can be up at that level in terms of um, doing um, biological research in this disease. So we need Dupuytren's disease researchers with cutting edge skills. Who are those people? Um, well, we all have our opinion on who those people are. So I'm going to give you my, opi in my opinion in terms of the three kinds of people that I need in my lab, and I don't expect this to be representative of every research lab. Dominic will probably have different thoughts and Rude will probably have different thoughts. But anyway, these are my thoughts. So I think tissue engineering is a big way for us to go. We need to be able to do tissue engineering to generate essentially reproducible cords in the lab so that they are reproducibly testable. We need students with skills in computational biology, and I'll tell you why we think we need those, and we need students with skills in epigenetics, and I'm going to have a brave attempt at covering that one. Um, so, um, so tissue engineering. To my knowledge, there is no lab in the world, and I'm please contradict me if you think I'm wrong, that can currently model Dupuytren's disease development in a lab. I actually put in a grant last year which was unsuccessful and one of the reviewers who came back to my grant told me that, um, Dr. O'Gorman, this is a lovely grant, um, you've got all kinds of great data but all you have are windows in time. You have not shown us that you have a model in your laboratory that actually shows the development of disease over time. And they were right. And I don't think anybody else does either. And we think we need one. So we need the people with the skills to make those things. So these models are going to be complex. They're going to be made up of human cells. They're going to be uh, with characterised, pre-characterised genetics by the geneticists that are in the room and many others. They're going to be grown in physiologically relevant extracellular matrices like I banged on about yesterday. Uh, they're going to be subject to biomechanical stresses, various biochemical stimuli. We're going to get the oxygen levels right for a change because I find it very, very unlikely that Dupuytren's disease cords grow at 21% oxygen because very few connective tissue uh, cells do, but yet we do all of our analyses at 21% oxygen. So that's bound to be you know, very non-physiological. So we need to fix this stuff. We need to make it much more like the hand. Um, and we like to say, this will give, maybe give rise to reproducible, high-throughput test beds for getting new therapeutic interventions. And I think we need to raise the bar and get it up to that level. So I talked about this little unit yesterday. So this is something we're using now, Matt, at the lab at the moment. This is a, a flex cell system. It's great. It imposes biomechanical stress. You can do cultures in three dimensions. Um, you can even potentially pop one of those things in a 2% oxygen chamber. I'm trying to do that at the moment. Um, so, you know, it, it's, we're getting there, but this is really not good enough. It still doesn't have a whole lot of cells. It doesn't, doesn't essentially have a flowing vascular supply. It doesn't 
well, you have yet yeah, haven't conquered the um, the oxygen loading components. We can't make the collagen dense enough so that it's physiological. There are a whole lot of barriers yet to overcome, and we're going to need people to overcome those barriers for us. Why would we need computational biologists? Bio biologists with computational expertise are needed to analyse very large data sets, bioinformatics. Now, there's lots of areas in which we're going to need this. Large patent populations um, uh, for some of the GWAS studies, for example, also for a lot of uh, other sort of uh, population large studies. We need people who can manage major data sets. The other side of the spectrum are uh, maybe small numbers of patients, but they're human genome data. That is massive data to deal with, and I can assure you I do not have the computational skills to deal with this. I've been fortunate enough to have a couple of PhD students who do, but um, we need the younger generation of people who can handle things like this so that we can uh, generate those kind of, that kind of data. So, like I mentioned, so uh, biomechanical molecule of cellular behaviours, GWAS studies, uh, epigenetic analyses. I'm going to speak briefly in a moment about chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing, which is a kind of a brave attempt that we've taken on recently, which I thought was going to be a six-month project, and we're coming on to our third year into it now, which I think says everything. Um, so, um, so this is chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing analysis, and I'm not going to take you through all of this, but the bottom line is that you generate whole genome sequences from all of these patients, all of which have to be re are realigned to the published human semen, uh, genome. You pull out a massive data set, and all of this has to be visualised in, in sort of uh, in silico. So these are some data from some of the stuff that we're doing at the moment. These are, happen to be beta-catenin interactions with the genome, and that's not really the point of this. The point of it is this. This was analyses done on six patients only. Nine samples, that's a very, very small data set. We generated two by 10 to the seven sequences, that's two by 10 to the seven reads, per person just to do these analyses. That was 300 gigs of raw data, right? By the time we'd processed that 300 gigs of data, it was two terabytes of data post-processing. That's six people. Can you imagine doing this on 100 people? <laughs> or 1,000 people? Or, you know, we don't have the capacity to do that right now, but I can assure you that in five years' time, the capacity will be there, and we need to be keeping up with those kind of things. Okay, epigenetics. Epigenetics, I think, is something that we didn't hear anything about in the conference this year, but I'm hoping we're going to hear a lot more about next year, because it essentially can be understood as the interface between the genetics that we've already heard quite a lot about and the environmental influences, which we know very little about, on the expression of genes and the translation of proteins in cells. So, just as um, uh, Roll Ulof gave us a, a lovely talk describing how geneticists look at things like single nucleotide polymorphisms and copy number variations and all of those kind of things, what epigeneticists look at are things like non-mutational changes to the genome. So like changes in DNA methylation or histone acetylation or histone deacetylation, activity of histone deacetylases, um, histone methylation on various things like lysines and arginines and things like that. All of these things regulate gene expression and all of them are probably changed in Dupuytren's disease. Matter of fact, I know some of them are. I'm going to give you just a very brief example to try and whet your appetite about what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you a quick brief overview, and this is why I get brave, on uh, genomic imprinting. So, as you all learnt in high school, um, Mendelian inheritances of the genes on your autosomes, so I'm not talking about sex chromosomes now, are expressed equally from both of the alleles you inherit from your parents. You've got one allele from your mum and you've got one allele from your dad and that those genes are co-expressed and they handle most of the things in your human genome. But there are some exceptions to this rule. Approximately 1% of the genes in the human genome display non-Mendelian expression, a parent of origin specific expression, what's known as imprinting, which probably as well that Gregor Mendel hadn't come across those. Um, so imprinted genes usually encode growth regulators. There are several of them in Dupuytren's disease tissue, I know, because we've looked. Um, IGF-2 is one of them. It's a dysregulated gene imprinted in Dupuytren's disease. So let me just give you a quick overview of how this works. Here's the allele you inherit from your dad and here is the allele you inherit from your mum. Here is the IGF-2 gene, and here is another gene that encodes a non-coding RNA called H19. On the allele that you inherited from your dad, and it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you got this from your dad, IGF-2 is transcribed like this. There's a little region in between, which is methylated on the allele you got from your dad, and not methylated on the allele you got from your mum. The gene that you inherited from your mum doesn't make IGF-2 at all. 
It has a big protein stuck to it called CTCF. And when you try to transcribe that gene, it bounces off the CTCF and it transcribes H19 instead. So that's normal. So this is not, this is not abnormal, this is normal. We have just screened just up to a dozen Dupuytren's disease cells derived from contracture tissue and 12 matching tissues derived from uh, normal palmar fascia. This, that what I just showed you, this situation, is what we see in normal palmar fascia cells. The situation we see in 9 out of 10 Dupuytren's disease cells is this, loss of IGF-2 imprinting. Suddenly we make IGF-2 from both alleles, not from one allele. And the reason for that is because we think we have abnormal methylation here. This is an epigenetic event. You can't detect this by doing genome sequencing. You can only detect this by doing epigenetics. So these are the kind of things that I think that are, hold the future for where we need to go. But to do this, we need to collaborate. We need to create, as I mentioned, reproducible, representative models of DD development in the lab to test new treatments. It won't happen unless we all get together and have international research collaborations that bring together the various expertise of all of our research team. Rude's team has expertise that my team certainly doesn't, and Dominic's has expertise that my team certainly doesn't, and there are many, many other researchers here who have expertise that I don't have. But we all need to get together and put our, pull our strengths so that we can come up with some really cutting-edge stuff. It won't happen without funding support. It won't happen without support from our clinical colleagues. You are all essential because you are the people that supply the tissues that allow us to do the studies. We can't do this without you. We need your help. And it won't happen without support of the Dupinus disease patient population. We need them to be get behind us, to help us raise money, to raise awareness, to help us make Dupinus disease research one of the most cutting edge research areas that there are, so that we're leading the pack rather than following the pack. So at this point, I'm going to hand across to Rude, and you're going to tell us about your goals. <laughs>